take the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. James Lee, WX4TV, and that's a really cool call sign. He is the managing design engineer for Shack in a Box, and it's a family business. He's been licensed, ham radio licensed since he was 13 years old. He's a former storm chaser and reporter for the Weather Channel. His household has five extra class amateurs and one general class amateur under the roof, which is quite an achievement. And uh, he's got lots of experience with field operations and emergency communications. He's the emergency coordinator for the Volusia Aries group. Did I pronounce that correctly, James? It's actually Volusia, but Volusia, uh, Volusia okay. is a good try. Okay, Volusia uh, Aries. Great, you can say hi too. <laughs> the, the girls are sitting here it's bedtime let me let the girls say hi here oh you bet we've got uh faith hannah our oldest daughter and this is grace our youngest extra in the in the family she's uh they were licensed at 10 and 8 respectively Get their uh, calls. um faith hannah what's your call sign my call sign is kilo delta three zulu and grace and mine is kilo echo three golf okay and Marvel. i think Michelle's gone to get one of the other girls. Our son is um, <laughs> in engineering school, and I think he's still working on on engineering stuff. He's he he uh, got on a video last year. This is you don't see me on the video because I'm doing calculus and stuff. You wouldn't understand. And this is Hope. And Hope, your call sign is November Delta to Lima. And uh, the the three girls here are the ladies of Shack in the Box. You can go back, ladies. You can go to bed. It's after ten. And <laughs> thank uh, you for lending your father to us. <laughs> Thank you for lending Thank you very your dad much, to us. James. Your 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 uh, children are are adorable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I saw a presentation that James provided uh, at Hamcation last Saturday, and it was extraordinary. It was it was a marvelous um, a marvelous presentation. And actually, he's going to be for providing a different presentation tonight, talking about the design characteristics and and the important aspects of designing go boxes so james you know please go right ahead and, and, and take it away okay thank you i'm gonna turn off my my video real quick and then i'm going to start sharing the screen again and hopefully i'll get it so it plays the uh plays the audio from my desktop this time um and here we go okay so here we go amateur radio go boxes by james lee wx4 tv and that's it thank you 73 no. Um, so uh, thanks for the, the introduction, Patrick. Uh, that was, uh, you've obviously done your homework. Um, just to real quick to, to reiterate, I'm WX4TV. And uh, when they started handing out vanity call signs, I, I first tried my, my initials, W4JGL. And that was so hard to say. And then a friend of mine who was a storm chaser as well, that's from England, we were actually filming a tornado, and he's he's a ham. He's a uh, Golf Zero November Echo Fox. He's you know your your call sign should be WX4 TV Weather for Television, and I applied for it and I got it three weeks later, uh, and that's how I got it. And I kept it, and uh, my son is actually WX4 TV J for Junior. Um, I as Patrick said, I was originally licensed when I was 13 years old. Um, my novice license came in the mail the day after the first space shuttle took off. And my wife, Michelle, is in here. Her call sign is November 8, Zulu, Quebec, Zulu. She can, she um, surprised me at a club meeting in 1993 by calling me on the radio with a what I at the time thought was a bogus call sign. I had no idea that she had gone and gotten herself a license. Um, and... Um, we're very active in amateur radio. Um, we do a lot of stuff in the field. Uh, that's uh, daddy daughter time. A lot of times is to get out in the field and do ham radio. And a little bit about me is my career um, was a uh, a cameraman, uh, war correspondent, freelance, adrenaline junkie. And it's really taken me places all over the world where stuff was either about to blow down or get blown up. Um, I've been to places, uh, spent about six weeks in Haiti after the earthquake, earthquake in 2010. 
uh, covered the aftermath of tsunamis and, and volcanoes. I've been in over 200 hurricanes and or tropical storms since Andrew in 1993 in war zones. Um, we also lived in Africa for a while and I've lived on several Caribbean islands and that kind of goes directly into our, our design and build uh, philosophy with our, our ham radio go boxes. I'm also the field operations lead for Aerobridge. And as I was saying before, Aerobridge, we coordinate um, the donation and use of civil aviation, civil aviation and business aviation assets uh, after z disasters. On the left there is a little island called Saba. Uh, the ham radio prefix is Papa Juliet 6. It is five square miles and over 3,000 feet tall. And I used to live there um, with uh, three of our kids. And it didn't have a much of a place where you could go buy parts for go boxes. So that'll go into the story as well. And on our right, that's just a pretty airplane that I got to actually got to fly when I was down in uh, Haiti. That's in Jacques Mel in Haiti in uh, February or March of 2010. And here's some other pictures, um, as you can see, uh, I was right at that blue dot there in the middle of Hurricane, um, who knows, I can't remember which one it was, 7-4-2014, that was probably Hurricane Arthur, and that's in Nags Head, North Carolina. Uh, the top picture there is in Galveston after Hurricane Ike, and then that's a picture of me standing in front of what used to be the White House in Port-au-Prince in 2010. And then there's a couple of our go boxes that are sitting, uh, literally living at the airport after Hurricane Dorian in uh, Abaco in Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas uh, in 2019. And uh, you guys may have recognized the girls possibly from the YouTube channel hamradio.world. Um, if you search hamradio.world, there's actually a website that will take you there as well. So we're gonna talk about go boxes tonight. And we're gonna talk about first or some of the, the uses that you can use go boxes for. It sounds like you guys kind of have an idea for it. Um, you know, you can use them for park activations, field day. You can take one on vacation, uh, islands on the air. Uh, the expeditions are a good place to use them. Uh, our family actually did a de expedition to the Dry Tortugas a couple of years ago, and that was fun. We've also gone camping with them. That's actually a picture of Grace, our youngest. At, her, at the time, her call sign was Kilo Mike 4 Tango X Ray Tango. And she's using an HF Go box that she and her sisters built. And she is activating uh, a state park called Hontoon Island in uh, Florida. You can also organize your gear in your ham shack and keep things tidy. Those of you who don't have entire families who are hams or spouses who are hams, keeping it tidy can keep your spouse happy. If you have little grandkids or little kids who like to touch things and put peanut butter and jelly in places they don't go, shouldn't go. You can put the cover on the radios when you're not using them and you can take them to other places if you want to. Now in that picture, that is Grace. She was probably from the looks at the log uh, working, uh, probably working a contest and you can see there's some go boxes there sitting in the ham shack and uh, the little pig is, is a, a pig. Uh, his call sign is Papa One Golf Golf Yankee or Piggy. Uh, that pig's actually been all around the world with me and uh, several very famous people and even a couple of world leaders have had their photograph made with Piggy. Um, and there'll be some other pictures of him. So watch for him as, as the as this thing goes on here. You can also use them in your car or your RV. Here in Florida, we've got a lot of itinerant people that come, uh, snowbirds that come in their RVs. And... Um, there's not a lot of room in the RV to set up your ham shack and or their, the spouses aren't too interested in having the ham shack set up all the time. So they'll put their ham shacks in a box and either put them on the, uh, the dinette table or out on, on a picnic table and use their ham, their radios when they want to. So it can save you money. Like if you're a new ham, we've got a couple of new hams who are wanting to build go boxes like the one in the picture, that's an ID5100A, and Faith Anna is actually using it during a bike-a-thon uh, in a SAG, SAG vehicle that was a donated Mercedes that we couldn't punch holes in. So 
you could use your radio at home in your car. You could take it to portable operations and you can keep it with you, lock it in the trunk so somebody doesn't steal it. So those are good, good ideas for some of the smaller go boxes that you can build, even the larger ones. That's another picture of using it in the car. That's our middle daughter, Hope. And that was actually during the, the first Falcon Heavy launch, which was a couple years ago this, this month. Um, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy, and they, uh, at the time, Faith Hanna's call sign was Alpha Echo 4 Falcon Heavy, or Faith Hanna, whichever way you wanted to say it. Um, so that was uh, them uh, working a satellite pass. They worked a bunch of satellites and worked about 300 stations there from about six miles away from the launch pad. And then we can talk about disasters and emergencies. I know you guys have to worry about wildfires, and uh, sometimes you have to worry about the, the ground shaking out from underneath you. Here in Florida, we don't get many earthquakes, but we do get hurricanes, tornadoes. We had some tornadoes actually yesterday, uh, wildfires, and wild, widespread power outages. Um, even on a, a blue sky day, it, we tend to have somebody in our neighborhood that runs into a telephone pole at least once a month and knocks the power out for a while. Um, during the disaster, um, you know, you can use them in, in shelters. I don't know if you guys do... Uh, shelters during wildfires or whatnot, but we'll open up shelters for hurricanes and whatnot. And typically the special needs shelters, the health department needs to have uh, backup communications and they'll pull in Aries to do that. And it helps to have your go box, um, your radio on a go box so that you can easily carry it and not run the risk of burning down a shelter or making the principal of the school that runs the shelter think you're going to burn it down. We had a local guy before I was uh, EC, I was one of the um, assistant emergency coordinators that in a hurricane about five or six years ago, um, really great guy, but not always thinking uh, uh, thinking things through. He carried his radio and one of his, the, the AC power cord was actually frayed a little bit. And when he plugged it in, it blew a fuse or blew, blew a breaker and he ended up getting kicked out of the shelter. Um, I, um, he doesn't do that anymore. He's, he's, uh, he, he's seen the light, but, um, but those are one of the, the things that you can kind of not do when you're using a go box and you have everything put together nicely. You can also use them in command posts. This is an actual picture of where I was living in, um, Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas. You can see the, the, um, Chinooks and the, uh, the Osprey helicopters there. And uh, I was living in that tent running HF wind link. We had a VHF repeater set up on a business band for another NGO that was there, had a repeater antenna up at 50 feet. And then I had a, a two meter 70 or two meter J pole that we had set up to try to see if any of the hams there had actually uh, made it through the hurricane and got on the air. Um, all the hams who were on the air during the hurricane never made it back on the air while I was there. And of course, um, this is a picture, you saw that before, the, the Windlink station, and you can see the VHF business band radio sitting up top there and um, a two meter rig sitting on the bottom. Uh, and then right before that, Hurricane Dorian made its pass by Volusia County, and we thought we were gonna have a category five hurricane as well. So we had Windlink set up in the EOC uh, with a 7300, rather than trying to do it with that old Kenwood radio that's sitting there to the left. So that's another opportunity for go boxes to be used. They're very easy to to move around and they look nice and uh, it's easier not to forget stuff. Um, here's another picture of uh, public service events. Um, we've used them at uh, Jamborees on the Air, uh, Boy Scout Merit Badge Weekends, Bike-a-thons, Walk-a-thons, Firework Displays. You can figure it out. You, there's a time to use it. This picture is from the MS-150, which is actually a two-day event where they ride uh, 75 miles down the coast from St. Augustine down here to Daytona Beach on the first day, and then they ride back on the second day. And it's a tri-county Aries event um, that we all work together to provide communications for that. And that's that's kind of cool. We actually brought an HF, VHF, UHF all in one go box with us that day because there were a couple of new hams that had never been on v UH, rather HF, and we got them on Got them on HF. There's Piggy again. That's another bike-a-thon with the, um, the go box and a, a solar generator that the girls made. So it's giving you an idea of what you can do um, 
with your go boxes. And Patrick, if you want, I'm happy to uh, send this um, this to you, and you can you can make it available so people can go back and look at it as well. Um, then we can think about what's going on in the world today. There are a lot of preppers. And if anybody is on Facebook, you're seeing all kinds of people asking, you know, well, I'm going to get a radio and I, I won't need a license if everything goes bad. Um, of course, we know that's not the truth. You kind of need to have a license to learn how to use that radio. But if the grid's down, uh, you're going to want to talk to your family or friends. Um, you need to have a way to power your gear. And uh, we're going to talk about building uh, solar generators. And then you got uncertain times with the, the political unrest and, and the wars that can be happening. And this was actually originally the, the two youngest daughters um, uh, presentation and they weren't allowed to say SHTF. So they put I'll, I'll stop that for you guys. They put that in there because they're not allowed to say SHTF. But they did say if uh, if the fan was running, it definitely would have been on there after that. Um, so when it hits the fan, uh, amateur radio will step up to the plate. And again, I'm, I'm sure as it has. And not having to remember to grab everything and did I get the right cord? Did I bring everything I need will probably help you out. So as I said, I was a ham since 1981. Michelle's uh, been a ham since 1993. And our, ch our children, uh, three of them got licensed in 2015. Grace got licensed in 2016. And we first started getting started with amateur radio in the field in 2015 with them. Uh, they did a jamboree on the air with one of the local clubs here in Florida. And they wrapped their uh, radio that they had then was a, uh, 897D in a towel and uh, they wrapped their Astron power supply in a towel. Um, they had to t make sure they brought all the wires and it was easy to forget stuff and it took more than one person to carry it because you couldn't carry it all at once. Um, that's a picture of Faith Hannah and Zechariah actually the day after the Jamboree on the air, they went to a local park and um, did a, did a uh, public service event there as well. Um, and in 2016, if any of you guys were involved in the National Parks on the Air, you know that really opened up the idea of being out in the field to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Um, and we did the same thing where we were carrying our radios into the field, wrapping them in towels, and we realized we needed to build a go box. It was time to make sure that it was all in one spot and not have to try to remember to bring everything. So the first one that we built, the kids... Um, by then had a 991 uh, Yacy radio, and we bought a Gator six rack unit tall. Um, actually, it wasn't even shallow, that's wrong. It was a 19 inch deep case. Um, and it was made out of the hard ABS plastic. And they, they put everything in there. Uh, we had an 8800, a 991, a, a, a YT 1200 tuner. Uh, a power conditioner that um, they use in the audio world to help clean up the the um, AC signal or AC power that's going into the the stuff that they use at concerts. We had an Astron power supply and we realized that it was pretty heavy. Um, this is a picture of Zechariah and Grace uh, figuring out the fit of everything. Uh, I think Grace was probably eight years old when that happened and he was probably 13. Uh, so that's, that's them actually figuring out the fit in their first go box. And then they used it all over the place. National Parks on the air. Uh, we've gotten lots of lighthouses on the air. Uh, one we've done a lot is the Ponce Inlet Light Station here just south of um, Daytona Beach. And uh, they've gotten a bunch of kids on the air doing that. Winter Field Day, the QSO parties. And then one of the coolest things they've done is something we call CQ Santa where we went to a local Lowe's right before Christmas. Uh, Santa was a guy who um, is uh, sitting at the North Pole about two miles away and on 40 meters, um, we let the kids talk to Santa Claus. And the, the wonder that was in their eyes when they were talking to Santa and hearing the QRM on HF was just incredible. Um, and it, it brought me back to my first experience with HF was when we lived in Gitmo when I was a kid 
and would talk back home to my grandparents over Navy Mars. And I, that was really what kind of piqued my interest in amateur radio was hearing the people that sounded like Donald Duck and ecstatic and wondering if Mimi was really on the other end of there. You know, it, it sounded a lot different than when she was on the phone. And it was, it brought, uh, I don't even know how to explain it other than it was, it brought a sense of wonder to me as a kid. And that was something cool we were able to do with that go box. Here's a picture of a little girl, another girl named Grace uh, with Hope watching her. Grace made her first contact uh, from the Ponce Inlet Light Station there. And she actually got a QSL card from the guy who she made the contact with. She was using our family club call um, doing that. And that was really cool. Uh, picture of Hope running field day a couple years ago um, with the go box that they built. And here's the Boy Scout Merit Badge Weekend. Now, if you look at the back of that go box, you can see that it's kind of a mess. We hadn't really learned how to make things neat and tidy. Uh, that was kind of neat and tidy, but not as good as they're doing it now. So we got all, I believe there were eight or ten Boy Scouts that were in this Boy Scout Merit Badge Weekend, and they, they all got to make contacts on HF. And we also did stuff on VHF, UHF with them, and some of them learned how to do their names in Morse code as well. And then here's the CQ Santa. Take a second and look at that kid. Do you see the wonder in his eyes there? He was talking to Santa Claus, who was, it's funny, um, is, is a Jewish guy um, who lives, you know, a few miles away. Um, but we all made it work. And, uh, he, he thought it was great that a Jewish guy got to play Santa Claus. And um, the, the kids who did it, uh, nine out of ten of them had a real sense of wonder. The other one, I think, was so scared to be sitting next to that beautiful girl who, wearing the, um, uh, what is that, a candy corn hat she made that I think he was more scared of her than he was talking, excited about talking to Santa Claus. But it just made a real cool impression, and it, it opened up a bunch of parents and some grandparents to the idea of amateur radio. That go box we took to the, um, we took to the Stone Mountain Ham Fest in 2017. And if you remember Mike Corey, uh, he was the AWRL uh, emergency communications director at the time. And then Greg Surratt was the uh, Southeastern Division director. Uh, they were the, the judges and the kids won first place. Um, they had a lot of cool things to say about it. Um, and then we decided we wanted to build some more. In 2018, uh, Faith, Hannah, and Hope and I uh, decided to go to the Dry Tortugas, which is a national park that is an island in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. You have to either take a, a seaplane to get there or take a ferry boat. And we went there for three days. So we, uh, we made some more go boxes. At that time, we had started using solar power. And uh, the two go boxes that they made were a VHF, UHF box that they were using for satellite, and then also a DH, HF, VHF, UHF, what they call a de-expedition go box. Here's a picture of the VHF UHF box, and it was built into a Pelican 1510 case. And both of these boxes were built into these cases. These are a size that are IATA approved for carry on on an airplane. The way that we had them built at the time would not have been legal to carry with any battery that was bigger than about nine amp hours um, because we were using lithium iron phosphate batteries. And as you can see, you can see the battery in there is that blue blue battery there next to the uh, the microphone. Um, but it has a wheels and a handle. It fits in the overhead compartment above your seat and it fits underneath the seat in front of you. And um, we used a TMV71A and a Buddy Pole Power Mini charge controller and used that to make uh, FM satellite contacts while we were at the Dry Tortugas. That's just another picture of it. As you can see, um, they had a something so they could write what the next satellite pass was and uh, had it mounted on a piece of, I think that was a piece of oak back then. They were didn't know uh, much about using metal plates and uh, they were learning how to saw wood and sand it and finish it. And a lot of this whole process has been teaching them skills that most kids aren't learning nowadays. So those are some skills that they learned as they were going. Um, the VHF, UHF, HF, the Expedition Go Box, um, is again in a Pelican 1510 case, and that had an 857D and a IT100. We also had a, an SDR in it and a, a signal link so that we could do digital modes and linear satellites with it. Um, 
this picture is actually in Kinston, North Carolina after Hurricane Florence. I was up there working as a cameraman and I also did some videos for the YouTube channel to so show how you could set up in a disaster area and then um, set up and break down quickly. Um, you may not be able to tell since it's over the internet, but you can see that there's water there. That's actually US Highway 17 and the Noose River is coming up very quickly. 15 minutes after I took this picture, this parking lot was underwater. And it was to show how quickly you could set up, get on 40 meters, make a contact, and then bug out. And it was kind of a cool thing to do. That's just another um, picture of it. Shows how they did it. Again, I think that was a piece of poplar. Uh, nowadays, they're actually doing something with... Uh, with this, but they're they're doing it in a different way, and I've actually got some pictures of that. So, uh, so here's some of the things they've done with it. First of all, they got on the cover of CQ magazine. Um, it just says C because uh, this was the mock-up. Um, but if you if you get the April 2019 CQ magazine, you'll be able to see Faith Ann and Hope there, and that's actually at Fort Fort Jefferson at the Dry Tortugas. Uh, we've done rocket launches, parks on the air, uh, satellite, and slow scan t television. Um, like I said, we did the uh, the N4T Dry Tortugas, the expedition. Earlier this summer, we did uh, Kilo 2 Golf from a park in the, um, Georgia as uh, Georgia for the 13 colonies. And they've actually won quite a few uh, radio sport contests. Um, they've got some plaques on the wall from some of the CQ contests. And of course, they've, they've sold a few of these, and we'll talk about their business later. Here's their QSL card, if any of you guys got to work in 4T. That's uh, a picture of where they were. Uh, I don't know if my, my mouse is showing up, but there's a little red dot right here. And that's where we were set up. And then there's pictures up here that show what everything looked like there on the island. They made uh, just under 2,000 HF contacts, and I think about 100 or so. Uh, FM satellite contacts in about 30, 36 hours of operating while they were down there. So we had a, we had a lot of fun. They also did the IOTA contest in 2018 so that they could test out and figure out how to camp. Uh, you couldn't get off the island and go to Walmart if you forgot something. So we went to the, the, um, the Florida Keys and we're going to pretend that there was no Walmart where we were because we needed to to um, get that experience. And guess what? There really wasn't a Walmart there within a hundred miles. So we kind of, <laughs> we kind of uh, did a real, real dry run. So what did we learn from all of this with our first go box? Don't include the kitchen sink. Um, something that we see a lot and you'll see it on the go box group on Facebook is people including everything in their go boxes. I've got this, I've got that. Um, We've seen some people put bottle openers on the back of their go box so they can open their beer. Um, we've seen uh, one rack unit plates with your call sign cut out of it with with a light behind it. I mean, if it's going to sit in your shack and you're not going to carry it out and have to worry about how heavy it is and whether or not you're going to run a battery out, okay, go ahead and do that. Uh, otherwise, you probably don't want to uh, include the kitchen sink. You probably just want to include the stuff that you need. Um, our go box was way too heavy. It took uh, two of us to move it. I could pick it up by myself, but for Michelle and the kids, it took two of them. Um, we figured out we did not need to include the power supply and the power conditioner. And if I don't talk about it, remind me uh, during the question and answers, we found out uh, that you can use a, a lithium iron phosphate battery uh, to run your whole station and not have to buy a power supply. Uh, and it's pretty cool how it works. And we've been doing it for three years and it works really well. So here's actually a close up picture of their first go box. And you can see how there's a lot of stuff in there. And it weighed, I think about what Michelle, about 50, 55 pounds. Yeah, she's saying probably she's sitting on the couch. Yeah, we were afraid if one of, if she or the kids had dropped an end of it, they dropped the whole thing. Um, so it was way too heavy. But here's some of the things we learned uh, about it in using it. Uh, with the all-in-one, we have the HF radio and the VHF UHF radio in the same box. If you want to take all your radios with you or do you want to keep them organized in the shack, maybe if you want to uh, have it at home sometimes or take it to your RV if you're going on a road trip, 
may be a good idea. It can be very heavy. If you're in a disaster and there's multiple uh, operators, one person using HF and one person using VHF, UHF, you can't separate from each other. And that can actually end up being a problem where there's too much local QRM um, and just you know physically being close to each other uh, in a tent where it's hot uh, kind of gets old. Um, so we have also built some single radio go boxes. This is a picture of one that the girls do. It actually has a 30 amp hour battery and a charge controller built into it. So it's kind of an all in one box with a 5100. Um, but in, in field day or, or disaster, you can separate multiple air operators and they're easier to carry obviously because they're lighter. And if you only need to take HF, just take HF. Or if you only need to take VHF, UHF, just take that. So it's not something that you need to, uh, that, that you're going to need to worry about taking everything if you don't need it. Again, this is a picture of Seva, Papa Juliet 6. Um, beautiful island. Um, the first night that we were there, uh, we lived, if you can see, like right over here at about 2,100 feet. First night we were there, the clouds literally came into our house. And um, yeah, it was interesting. And there was a one or two uh, hardware stores there and everything you ever needed, they'd have to order from St. Martin or the United States. So if it broke, you weren't gonna get an easily replaced part. Like we had a stove in our house that they had put the wrong kind of, like they put natural gas vents in our stove instead of propane vents. And it took a month and a half for us to get the right vent so that we could actually cook on our stove. Um, so you're not going to get that replacement part very easily. And the same thing can go for an emergency or a disaster or a de-expedition or vacation. And so we got to thinking about it. If your life, if your family's lives or the lives of others are going to depend on your ability to communicate, cheap is not going to be reliable. You want to use quality components. Um, and also if you're on vacation, let's say that you, you convince your spouse to let you take your box with you to St. Martin. If it breaks and you can't buy the part, your vacation operating shot. Now your spouse, your spouse might be happy about that since you're not going out and operating, but your dual D expedition is going to be shot and you're not going to be happy that you didn't get to get on the air from that cool place that you took your go box. So we are using quality components now with our stuff. And that was one of the things that Mike Corey and Greg Surratt said is that they noticed that we weren't using MFJ tuners. We weren't using the cheap RG58 coax. Uh, at that time we were using DX engineering coax. We actually use something different now and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is a picture of their HF go box. This actual go box went with me to the Bahamas. Uh, that one that you're looking at and all it has in it is a 7300 uh, an ICOM front facing speaker and an LG, LDG IT100 tuner. And then on the back, we've got an easy to access input output panel with a common ground point where you can ground everything to a quarter inch screw uh, with a wing nut. And then all your, your antenna connections and your power connections are there. So you don't have to reach into the go box. So we're using Gator cases. And as you notice, this is, doesn't look like the case that our first one was in. This is what they call a roto molded or rotationally molded case. These cases, um, the rot roto molded cases are made from a thicker and softer plastic that help protect the contents a little bit better. The ABS plastic is prone to breakage if it gets hit with a, a sharp object. Um, and it's, we just don't think it's as good at protecting the radios. Now, there are some other things like uh, you have more room to put stuff in them and um, Michelle likes them for some other reasons. Uh, for taking them in the, in the field though, the ABS plastic is not the best way to go when you're doing, when you're doing uh, a rack mount kit like this. We're also using Nanook cases, which actually I thought I had a picture, but I don't. Uh, Nanook is sort of like Pelican, uh, but we found that they are better. And if you go to the web, uh, the uh, YouTube channel, Hope actually has, no, Grace did a video this weekend on the differences between one of the Nanook cases and the Pelican cases. And there are actually some fairly significant differences 
on shows you why we like them better. The coax that we're using in our boxes now is from a company called Messi and Poloni. They're an Italian company. Their coax, uh, I've used a lot of coax around the world. It's absolutely the best stuff I've ever bought in, unless you get into like hard line. Um, the shielding is much better. Uh, we've actually done some stuff where we've put, um, I haven't put DX Engineering 8X next to it, but we've put some high quality 8X next to the, the Messi and Poloni Hyperflex 5 and put it next to, both of them next to a noisy generator and found that the Messi and Poloni does a much better job of shielding out that, that RFI um, than the, uh, the other stuff. And they've got connectors that are a combination of compression and solder that are incredible. They're also waterproof. Um, so we're using those. We're using um, solar power connectors that are, are made by a company called Furion. If any of you guys or, or ladies are into the RV world, it's the standard two-pin connector that they use on RVs. Um, and then they're also using marine-grade heat shrink crimp connectors. So when you crimp it, not only has it got a nice crimp on it, you use a heat gun and it shrinks it down and it's got... Um, a heat melt glue in it that kind of helps everything stay stay put together. They're not as prone to, we've never had one fail actually, uh, they're not as prone to vibration or falling apart that way. Um, we're also using, uh, where we are including hardware, we're using stainless steel and we're using Nylox lock nuts um, because those are virtually impossible to, to have come off by vibration. And then I've got here pure copper AWG wire. Now, why would I talk about AWG wire? Because we found out, uh, I'm not going to name any names of the vendors that sell them, but there are some vendors in HamFest that will sell you some 8-gauge wire or sell you some 10-gauge wire, and it looks like it should be 8 or 10-gauge wire. You get it home and you strip off the strip it off and you realize it's really like 16 or 14-gauge wire, and it's got a really thick jacket on it. Uh, the AWG is the American Wire Gauge. If you get something that is 12 AWG, it has to meet a standard. And it's going to be th that many strands and that thick, and it's going to be able to carry the, the amperage that you want without having um, the, uh, the loss that you don't want to have. So we found that you need to spend the money and make sure you buy wire that is good. Um, we were getting our wire from PowerWorks, um, and then we found out that the stuff that is on Amazon, that's the uh, pure copper uh, wire that's actually the, the American wire gauge, is just as good as the PowerWorks stuff and doesn't cost as much. Um, we also are using quality radios and components. I'm not saying that your Bofang is, is you know, going to not send you to heaven like some people do, but I do know from experience that things that tend to be made in China tend not to work when things go bad. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we found that, the, you know, the kids actually, their first radios were, were UV5Rs. And within two weeks of having them, the, the, the antenna connections have come loose. Uh, so we stick with our amateur radio gear. We stick with Icom, Yesu, Kenwood. Um, we haven't done anything with Alacraft. We may sometime. But with the, the manufacturers that have a track record of building stuff that doesn't break. Um, so we're using that. We're also using exclusively bioinno power lithium iron phosphate batteries. And we actually melt, met them out there in Orange County in 2016 when our, our flight was canceled and Hope wanted to see the ocean. And I said, well, you might as well. You've come this far. Let's go see the ocean. And on the way back, we saw this place and pulled in and met them and saw what they were doing and realized that it was very useful for ham radio. And uh, telling the guy all about ham radio, then we find out that Gordon West lives right down the road and is friends with him, and they knew all about <laughs> ham radio. But um, anyway, that was uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship that we've had with them, and we still have a wonderful relationship with them. Uh, as you can see in here, this is the inside of the new D Expedition in a box. That's an ICOM seventy one hundred, and a Bio Inno thirty amp hour battery is in there, uh, and it's held in place with that purple bar that they bent on a metal brake. Um, and it's uh, that was as the thing was being designed and built. We also learned that you need to use the right tools. So how did we learn that? We learned it the hard way. We first started drilling holes. We'd take them out front. We'd put them on a on a on a board and 
and the girls would kneel down and take a cheap drill and some cheap drill bits and try to drill a hole and it, it would slip down the the go box and you know, go the wrong way on the panel or something. Um, we realized that uh, actually using a center punch and measuring things properly and using a drill press with expensive drill bits actually is worth the money because you don't spend $200 on replacing panels that you drilled wrong. Uh, you spend that on the on the drills, the drill bits once every every year, six months, and then you 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 know you're using the right tools. We did not know that you're not supposed to solder Anderson power power poles. Who 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 knows that? Who's <laughs> we didn't uh, we we soldered them and we had a bunch of them fail because they wouldn't fit into the uh, the connectors properly. We crimped using pliers. Now. I'll go back and say, I knew a lot of these. I didn't know it about the Anderson power poles, but I like, we homeschool our, our kids and we want them to learn from uh, experience. So if you do it wrong and then figure out how to do it right, it cements it in your brain a lot more than if somebody just shows you the right way. So um, we, we tried stripping wires with, you know, those pliers. Um, we used an, you know, cheap Chinese soldering iron and, and melted so much dielectric with on coax. You, we, we had probably, Two hundred dollars in coax we ruined over the, a couple of years. Um, we even used pliers and rubber bands to hold things uh, while we were soldering. And the, the last the faux pas that we did is I had them use a lighter for heat shrink instead of a heat gun. That's not happening anymore. As you can see, Grace is using a high quality Dewalt heat heat gun. Uh, they're using the proper crimpers and, and uh, tools right now. Uh, one of the cool things we have is some flexible arms that they use in soldering. And this is one you can get off of um, uh, Amazon. And it wasn't that much. It's called Quad Hands. We've been through a couple of these. And this is the only one we've ever had that actually worked and didn't fall apart. Uh, we really like that one. And hopes they're building a, a jumper for one of the go boxes. And it's holding the holding the coax. And it's it's doing a really good job using the right tools. So... As you're thinking about building your go box, um, think about, do I have the right tools? If you don't have the right tools, can you borrow them? Is it cheaper to buy them or is it cheaper to get somebody else to do it to you? There's a lot of variables that go into it, but um, try to do things, do things right. So the things that we learned about it, you remember our first go box was too heavy. We had a power supply in it. We had uh, a large rig runner, which we found out we're not using rig runners anymore. We're using inline fuses uh, because the rig runners were introducing a, between a 0.1 and 0.2 voltage drop at, at a 10 amp load um, where the, the inline fuses aren't doing that. So we stopped using the rig runners. Um, we're now powering our go boxes with lithium iron phosphate batteries in boxes, uh, which we, we make some of those for ourselves. We don't make them with the company anymore, but we're now making solar generators, which are, as you can see, it's we're using Buddy Pole Power Mini charge controllers. Uh, and you guys need to take a look on the internet at the Buddy Pole Power Mini. Power Mini is one word. That charge controller, first of all, is extremely RF quiet. We've had them on a service monitor. You can't see them on a service monitor. Um, and they provide an incredible amount of data as to how much power you're putting into the battery with solar, how much you're taking out, have you had a net gain or net loss from your battery. Uh, you can program to, to charge virtually any battery chem chemistry um, up to 12, 12 volt batteries or 14.6 volt batteries. Can't go to 24 and 48, but you can go down to like a, a three volt battery. Uh, it's really cool the parameters that you can set in this thing. Um, and those, those are incredible. So we, we use those in our solar generators. Now we also, as you can see, we used a large polycrystalline solar panel. We also had some lead acid deep cycle batteries. One of the things that we learned about the, the lead acid batteries, first of all, you can only use 50% of the capacity without, um, damaging the battery. So if you have a hundred amp hour battery, like we do over there in that picture, that weighs a lot, um, you can only take 50 amps out of it. Um, you can only recharge lead acid four to 500 times. Um, and if you take it down 10 or 15% and recharge it, that counts as a charge cycle. And if any of you guys use radios that are made by Yesu and you've used lead acid, you may have noticed when you key up um, and you talk, your frequency changes and people say something's wrong with your radio. That's because lead acid batteries 
when you put them under load, they actually drop below the minimum voltage that's in the uh, the parameters for the Yesu radios. Uh, other radios, I think, probably as well. We didn't have that problem with an ICOM 7300 or with a KX3. Uh, obviously, KX3 is not drawing that much amps. Um, but that was an is issue we had. And then we tried using um, uh, a voltage booster, which introduced a lot of RFI into our received signals. Um, and those cost a couple hundred bucks. And then we also tried a supercapacitor bank, which if you were rag chewing, I think would work well uh, because you would have time between transmissions to have the supercapacitors charge back up. Um, when you're running pileups or you're working uh, DX or you're contesting, um, the capacitors didn't have enough time to um, charge back up between transmissions. And after five or six transmissions, we'd run into the same problem with low voltage. And then the solar panel got broken. It was big, it was fragile. And we had a friend um, uh, who, uh, it was actually the ICOM one, ICOM, MCOM one van that ICOM has, uh, a friend of ours built it and he was bringing it home from a ham fest for us. And somebody ran a stop sign in, or stop light in front of him. He slammed on brakes and some Motorola chargers or Motorola batteries went into the panel and that was the end of the panel. Uh, it didn't work anymore. And it weighed like 35 pounds. There's a picture of Grace um, learning how to hook up those two large batteries that weighed a lot. And there's the broken panel. And she was, as you can see, she was shocked. What she was shocked was is that it was still generating electricity. Not enough to do anything with, but they had fun playing with that. And as you can see, our son Zechariah and Michelle are picking up that battery. It takes two of them. That's a 100 amp hour lead acid battery. I don't remember how much it weighed. It weighed a lot, as Michelle says. But here's a picture of Grace holding a 30 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery that gave us more run time from a charge than that 100 amp hour lead acid battery did. And she's an eight or nine year old kid holding that battery with no problem. So that I think if that doesn't sell you on lithium iron phosphate, then you, I don't know what is. Uh, <laughs> those two pictures there. Um, so the, so the lithium iron phosphate batteries from BioNo, um, I will disclose, you know, the, the girls business shack in a box, they are dealers for BioNo. There are other batteries out there that are made, uh, that are lithium iron phosphate. We haven't used a lot of them of the ones we have used. We have found that BioNo we like the best. And what we like the best about them is that the, first of all, they work. And secondly, they stand behind their products. Um, the lithium phos or lithium ferrite bond is extremely strong and it takes a temperature of I don't remember exactly what it is but it's over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit to get them to catch on fire um, we have seen we haven't done it with ours because we don't want to ruin our batteries but we have seen people actually put a hundred amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery under load with about a 50 amp load and then shoot it with a 12 gauge shotgun and it sat there and smolder but it never caught on fire uh, if you do that with a, a LiPo or a lithium ion battery, you're going to end up having uh, a fire and an explosion. And what's really cool about them is this voltage stays constant right up until the end of the battery capacity. So your radio doesn't need to have a voltage booster. They work great. They're, they're wonderful uh, with, with um, you know, the nominal voltage is 13.8 volts. They work great for ham radio. They have pr protection circuitry in them that keeps you from over discharging or overcharging them or putting too much current on it. You can't break the battery by discharging it too much because the computer on board won't allow that to happen. And you can use 90% of the battery's rated capacity. Now here's the cool thing. Remember we said you can charge a lead acid battery for four to 500 times. You can charge one of these things up to 5,000 times. And if you take 25% of the charge out of the battery and you recharge it and you do that on lead acid, it counts as a charge cycle against you. With a lithium iron phosphate, if you take 25% out, it counts as one quarter of a charge cycle. Hmm. If you take 10% out, it counts as 10% of a charge cycle. So over, and we did the math on this and I, I need to do a video and, and actually show the math. I sat there with Kevin from BioNO uh, a couple years ago. Over the lifetime of a battery system, Let's say you get a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, and they cost about a thousand bucks for 100 amp hours, about $10 an amp hour. Um, 
and then you get a hundred amp hour lead acid battery is going to cost you about 300 bucks. You're going to have to buy a whole lot of lead acid batteries um, over the lifetime of that system because they're going to wear out. Let's give it, let's say you only get 2000 charge cycles out of a lithium iron phosphate and you get 500 charge cycles out of a lead acid. So, you know, that's, that's at least four times more charge cycles. And you remember that's, if you charge it, take it down to its its discharge of 50%, that, that's given it to conservative. We've used as much as we can, we're filling it back up. We figured out that on average, over the lifetime of a battery system, lithium iron phosphate will cost you 85% less per watt hour that you get out of and put into that battery system than using lead acid. Hmm. And that's pretty cool. Uh, as hams, we don't always think about the long-term stuff. We think about stuff being cheap or the, the initial outlay. But over time, uh, lithium iron phosphate is a much better way of doing it. So that brings us to the solar generators. And I will stop here real quick. So this is a, a 30 amp hour solar generator. Um, we use something like this. We use a 30 amp hour battery in our home shack. And we run a lot of contests and um, we spend, when we do, we spend a lot of time on the radio. On uh, N1 Zulu Zulu, Dan, who started West Mountain Radio and then sold it to somebody and he also runs Paradan Radio. He lives down by uh, Cape Canaveral and he's a friend of ours. He says, you know, I run my contest station off of this battery and I just keep it plugged into the bio NO six amp hour, six amp charger. And I was like, no, you don't. You can't run a 100 watt station like that. And he says, yeah, you can. So I said, well, that's proven wrong. That was three years ago. And it works. I, I would think that if you're, if you're doing, um, you know, CW or RIDI, where you're drawing more, more um, duty cycle than if you're using single sideband, maybe it wouldn't work. But we're able to run our station um, FT8, Winlink, where we're running 20, 30 watts. Um, or 100 watts with the radio um, in per perpetuity just by keeping the six amp charger plugged in. It doesn't cost, it doesn't um, cause any, any RFI that we can tell. We haven't noticed any RFI. I haven't looked at it on a service monitor to see if there's not something somewhere. We've not been able to hear it. But that means when the power goes out, we still get to be on the air. Um, and we don't have to have an Astron power supply or Samlex power supply, or, so we've, we've, you know, spent $300 on a battery that's going to last probably eight to 10 years. And these new switching power supplies probably aren't going to last that long. So you spend a little bit more money, but you get a lot more usefulness out of it because if you have a earthquake or if we do have the end of the world, the battery can be recharged with solar. And then you've got, power that you can keep using without having to burn diesel or or um, gasoline or whatnot. So back to the solar generators. We're building our solar generators into Nanook cases and we're using the BioNO power batteries and the, the buddy pole charge controllers. Um, as we talked about, um, those buddy pole charge controllers give an incredible amount of of data that you can use. You can also use, and we have used in some of our builds, the BioNO charge controller, which um, is a dumb charge controller. It doesn't have any information that it gives you. It just charges the battery. It can use a, a 20 amp charge current where the buddy pole can use a 12 amp charge current. Um, we've been told that FEMA, if we start selling the FEMA, they're not gonna want to have the buddy pole because they just won't plug and play. Um, if I were out in the middle of nowhere, which I am a lot, I'd like to know exactly how much power I've used and how much power I've put in so that I can make informed decisions on how I use my power. Um, but there's, there's two ways of doing it. Um, we have also used the charge controllers that you can get from PowerWorks. We have purchased 24 of them and every one of them has introduced so much RFI, they're absolutely unusable. And PowerWorks, when I told them about it, uh, essentially said that I wasn't telling the truth. Um, eventually, there will be a video on YouTube to show how much RFI those things um, put out. I wouldn't spend the money on them. Um, go with BuddyPole or go with uh, 
by ONO. Uh, they're making, and also there's another one by a company called Genesun. They make very good power uh, charge controllers as well. We just, we don't use the Genesun because they're very expensive, but they're extremely RF quiet. As you can see here, the Buddy Pole Power Mini, you can see it's got the, um, the, the voltage of the battery is at 13.7 volts. Everything else is saying zero on the amps because we had just turned it on for the picture. But let's say we had turned it on for a couple of hours. We, we could see that we had maybe used 3.6 amp hours out of the battery and then we had put 2.7 amp hours back in. Then you can hit that select button and the next one will tell you exactly how much juice you're getting out of your solar panel at the moment. It will tell you your maximum that you've gotten out of your solar panel whether you have a net gain or a net loss in your system. And then the next screen gives you a little bit more information. And then the final screen actually lets you set up your parameters for charging the batteries. You can set it to where the max charge is, what the, the maximum voltage it'll cut off if your battery goes above that voltage or if your panel goes above that voltage or the maximum, the minimum shutoff voltage. What we do is we set, um, we set the minimum uh, voltage for about a tenth of a volt higher than the, the minimum voltage that the battery will cut off. And we set the max voltage at about a tenth of a tenth of a volt lower than the max voltage. So that gives us two degrees of protection. If for some reason the circuitry in the battery doesn't work, we have the buddy pole that's going to be a, a, a second uh, protection on it. This is the um, the what the solar charge controller from BioNO looks like. And it's just it works. Uh, it doesn't have any of the cool information. Uh, this is one that Hope is building uh, for us to use at home. It'll have a 50 amp hour battery in it. And purple is her favorite color and it's also the signature color of the company. So that's why that panel was was coated in purple Cerakoting. Um, this is a 600 watt hour battery box that the girls built. Uh, it's got a 50 amp hour battery in it. Um, and uh, it can run uh, at the time we were using that to uh, power our home shack for a while. And um, like we said, we don't we don't need to use the uh, the power supply anymore. And the cool thing, it works like a UPS, an, uninter an uninterruptible power supply. So if the power goes out, the the radio keeps working. Um, so you know we have a UPS that will we'll run our our logging computer, one of the ones from Triplight runs our logging computer and it runs our, our our monitors and then the the shack is run off of this of course the linear is not run off of it um, so if they're using the linear and the power goes out too bad you're back to 100 watts and be honest young lady voices don't need the linear to break through pileups most of the time anyway <laughs> so <laughs> that was although when they did get the linear this summer um, and the first time they called and broke through a pileup, uh, I think Hope said, we've come to the dark side and they have cookies. Uh, so anyhow, so that brings us up to solar panels. Um, we really like the ones from BioNO. Uh, we like everything that they, they make and sell. It's just really good stuff. Um, they stand behind it. They have a couple different kinds of, of panels. They have the uh, rigid panels, which you can see here. Um, they're made out of the monocrystalline um, cells, and they are uh, built into aluminum frames. They're heavy, but they can stay out in the rain, and they're not going to blow away. Um, and if it gets really windy, you can put some stand, sandbags on the on the, the legs in the back. Uh, they have some portable folding, folding panels. We call these other ones. We call these transportable because you can transport them, but they're not. You're not going to put them in a suitcase and carry them on a plane. Whereas this is a hundred watt panel. Uh, I don't know the, the technology that they have on there. It's not thin film and it's also not uh, the mono crystalline. I don't know what it's called that they're using there, but they work very well. They're built in, they fold up in, in four there. They weigh about 10 pounds. Um, they're in a Cordura nylon case there. They actually fit in a Pelican 1650 case where we keep a lot of our stuff that we use for deploying. Uh, we keep antennas and tent stakes and ground rods and stuff in there and, and coax. So they fit in those boxes very well. Uh, they are not in, the, in good in the wind or the rain. Um, as you can see, those little grommets on the end. You could put uh, a little tent stake nail like the ones that you can get from Walmart in there, but um, 
the feet in the back uh, don't won't don't connect to the ground and uh, it'll blow away in a heavy wind. So that's something you've got to think about. I guess maybe you could put a sandbag back there and hold it. Um, but there are trade-offs with everything. Uh, if you need extremely portable, these are extremely portable and we like them a lot. So as we said, uh, you know, the girls started Shack in a Box. That's their company. Hope came up with the idea, uh, putting a shack in a box. And it's, uh, as you can see, shackinabox.com with hyphens in between everything. Um, and uh, in April 2019, somebody wanted to buy their box and they weren't really interested in selling it because they had put the, all that work into it, used it everywhere. And then I, I, you know, told them, well, if you sell it, you can buy a 7300 and you that you want and uh, you could build another go box. So they, they ended up selling it. And then, of course, a week and a half later, we were at Dayton and um, in the first drawing, I think out of nine prizes, our family won four of them including a, a 7300 uh, so they ended up with two of them um so they they uh they built their their first uh, 7300 go box and later that year they sold their first one uh that they had actually built uh and they, they call their business shack in a box this is a picture of them at uh, the first real ham fest since they they started their their business that's the three of them faith hannah is on the left and Grace is in the middle there and in Hope. That's at the Melbourne, Florida Ham Fest in 2019. So they're, uh, they're uh, actually in business now and um, they're making, uh, let's see, this is their VHF, UHF, uh, HF Go Box. That's got a 7300 and a 4100 in it along with a LDG tuner. Grace is using that in a state park here somewhere in Florida. And of course, they've got this one, like I told you, where they're building, um, this is a two rack unit case. It has a 30 amp hour battery in it. You can plug it into the wall and use it in a shelter. You can use it off the battery or it even has a solar panel connection with a, one of those BioNO 20 amp hour or 20 amp solar uh, charge controllers in it. And Ron, I see you looking closely. Uh, I will give this to Pat Patrick so you guys can go back and look at this again. Uh, if you want to, and we can go back and when if we ask questions and show you some stuff. This is the one that went with me to the um, to the the, uh, the Bahamas after the hurricane, and this is a new cool one, the expedition in a box. This one I gotta give them a lot of credit. This one is an Icom 7100 uh, built into the Pelican case. You guys saw the inside of it a little bit ago. It has a 30 amp hour battery in it, uh, and what looked like speakers there. Um, right here and back here. These are not speakers. This is an input for airflow. And there's a temperature switch over here on the heat sink underneath that at 111 degrees Fahrenheit, it turns on this exhaust fan. It draws the air across the radio and spits it out. And what happens uh, with Bernoulli's effect or the ideal gas equation, I don't remember which one, probably the ideal gas equation, as you go through here and compress the air as it goes through those little holes, it expands, it drops about a half of a degree, draws some semi-cooler air across it and spits it out the other end. Down here, we have a voltmeter with a thermometer on it. The thermometer is, is connected right next to the uh, heat sink as well. The radio, according to ICOM's technical support people, is okay to use up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. We've never gotten it above 100. 25 and that was using it in the summertime uh, we used this go backs when we did the uh, kilo two golf and boy it was hot in july in southern georgia and humid and did i say it was hot uh, but anyway we've used it a lot never gotten it above 125 and it works really well we've we've had a lot of fun with that this is their 720 watt hour uh, solar generator that they're building now um, both the, the 30 amp hour or 30 amp hour or what is it 320 watt 360 watt hour and this one's got a 60 amp hour battery they are still in negotiations to have some of the parts made uh, so that they can lower the price and I think we're almost there if you want to build your own which uh, I think it's cool if people want to um, they've got some links on the shack in a box website that there's a button that says build your own and there's some links to some of the stuff that you can get off of Amazon 
Um, and if you buy it through there, it's the same price, but they make a little bit of a commission for you going through their website. So that, that helps them with their YouTube channel and colleges and whatnot. So when HamFest start again, and we just found out today that the uh, HamFest in Huntsville is back on. So we've got a booth reserved for Huntsville. If anybody wants to come to HamFest, come to Huntsville in, in I think, the third weekend in uh, August. And you will get to meet Piggy there. He was uh, spending the night in the hammock there um, at one of the ham fests last year. And you'll get to meet him. And uh, that's it. Anybody got any questions, um, comments, uh, kick me out, what do you, whatever you want to do. Well, that, that was absolutely great, James. And uh, I appreciated it a great deal. Um, I, I was... You know, uh, during the Hamcation uh, presentation on Saturday, I was the one who, who uh, asked the question about manual tuners, and you had answered that those LDG tuners uh, seem to have been able to uh, tune almost anything that you connected up to it. So can you give me just a, a little more detail on that? I will say that an LDG tuner will probably tune a baseball bat or a pineapple. Um, they will match about a 10 to 1 um mismatch they don't have as good of luck as tuning um a mismatch has got uh, a lower impedance rather than a higher impedance so sometimes especially with some um doublet antennas where you're using like a ladder line antenna you may have to switch out your ballon to be a one-to-one -one ballon instead of a four-to-one because it can lower the impedance too low but as far as using like an infed or um, a trapped dipole or anything that you might be using in the field, uh, we've not had any problem with, with getting them to match virtually anything. And um, I'll, I'll stop this so you guys can see me here. Um, <laughs> the, they will, they'll match virtually anything. And the, um, the cool thing is if you're using high quality coax, you know, this Messi and Poloni coax, when you get up to their their uh, half a centimeter type or one centimeter in diameter RG8, LMR400 type coaxes, it's really low loss. Um, even their Hyperflex 5 is, is pretty low loss on HF. Um, when you get up in the UHF, you're having some problems with it, but any of those coaxes are going to have problems. So you're operating... In the field, typically your coax runs are going to be 50 feet or less. So using uh, an antenna that may have a higher SWR uh, is not as much of an issue as it is when you're at home and you have a 300 foot co uh, coax run. Okay, I, I, I've just been a dyed in the wool manual tuner guy for, you know, since 1982 when I was first licensed and um, I just know that there's limitations to the built-in tuners in the HF transceivers. So uh, I just- Yes, the, the, HM, the, the HF transceivers, with the exception of the yellow craft, will only match uh, three to one. Right. And the yellow craft tuners will, will, will tune a baseball bat as well. In fact, we got one to uh, tune a, a uh, magnetic loop that we didn't realize that the, the tuner was turned on in the aircraft, I'm sure it caused some crazy voltages. Uh, when we were out there, actually at the uh, Joshua Tree National Park that night, we had tried using a, a loop antenna way up on, on top of the mountain. Um, the LEG tuners, we've not had any issue with. Um, and I go back to my first HF station in the car. Uh, I had a 102 inch whip and a homebrew manual tuner that I had you know, super glued to the dashboard of my cheap car. So that was back in, in the, the late eighties, early nineties. And um, manual tuners are great, but these new, new ones from LDG, I've not had any issues with them. And are they operating on 12 volts DC? Uh, they're either operating on 12 volts DC, which you can take, uh, you know, from your, your power poles or they're operating from the voltage that's coming from the radios nowadays. Okay, well, that's just food for thought for when I uh, put in an HF radio in the car. Yeah. I was going to put but, in a well, manual tuner, and now I'll... You know, I'll if you're doing HF tuner. radio in a car, I would highly recommend looking at the, the Tar Heel antennas. 
the the screwdriver antennas. Um, I've I've worked 160 some countries from the suburban uh, with 100 watts and a, a little Tar Heel too. They're they're incredible antennas. Have they been reliable in the the heat Absolutely. and salt Absolutely. air that you have? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't had any issues. The ATAS 100 or 120 or whatever they are from Yesu, yeah. uh, they break real quickly down here. Mm -hmm. But the Tar Heel antennas, and those are the only screwdriver antennas I've actually played with. The Tar Heel antennas uh, just keep working. Okay. Good to know. Mm -hmm. So anybody else have any questions? James, we Quiet bunch. <laughs> Now yeah. that I've seen my wife says I overwhelmed you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you very much. We we've enjoyed that a great deal. I've seen both presentations now, and and uh, I'm glad I've seen them both because they're 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 wonderful. I, my wallet is what's overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. Uh -huh. um, there's a guy who is a client now. Uh, he he purchased from the girls at Hamcation last year, and at the Lawrenceville Ham Fest that year that. Uh, they won the go box contest grace or hope and i think it was grace did her her presentation on solar and he comes out and says your kid just cost me forty five hundred dollars i'm like what he says i don't know much about this stuff but i got a lot of money and i just went and bought everything she talked about and i was like wow <laughs> <laughs> so yep. he's actually he actually purchased a solar generator from us um at the location <laughs> last February. <laughs> well I'm I'm certainly looking at now at at, at uh, using one of those uh those bioano batteries for, for the shack here in the house because you build a, a solar generator like you have and not only is it you know great for you know as a UPS but it's portable. You just it is, and, and you know you don't up. have to put it in a box if you don't want to. The mm -hmm. the boxes are nice because they're going to protect the battery and protect everything. But all you really need is that battery and the uh, the Buddy Pole Power Mini, and you're you're set up for solar. Uh, and if you don't want to do solar, uh, the battery is is the, a way to get started. And you can carry that battery with you. You can wrap it in a towel like we used to do with our our radios. Uh, you can put it in a box. PowerWorks has some very inexpensive boxes that um, don't do a great job of holding up over time into abuse. But um, yeah, I see your manual tuner back there, Patrick. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but there's you don't have to to go super expensive with it. We would love to have the girls build something for you, but uh, the spirit of a ham radio is is to do it yourself. And if somebody wants to do it, the, 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 the tools are out there to do it. And the stuff from BioNO is just incredible. It's it's worth the money that you spend on it. Well, I'm, I'm talk about the panels themselves. Start. I'm sorry, what's the question, Randy? Talk about the panels themselves. As far as getting into the solar panels, what kind of money are you talking about for the two panels that we we're looking at? Okay, so I know that the, uh, the portable one is... Um, 209 and i'm going to real quick look and see how much they sell the other ones so they had some price changes some stuff went up and some stuff went down let me see what they charge for that and i'm pulling it up if i can here um the 120 watt panel they sell for two thirty four ninety nine, so really not a whole lot of money for the. Not for the you know, you can get the other panels from Harbor Freight and Renogy and some of these, and they, they it work. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, they they work, but I can say that BioNO tends to underrate what they say you're going to get out of it. The hundred twenty watt panel, uh, the the same day that we were there at that that bikeathon thing, and that now, granted this is in Florida. And uh, we're down here in the lower latitudes, but we were getting 136 watts out of that 120 watt panel uh, in the full direct sun. And the sun was at uh, about 25 degrees in, in height. And, um, you know, we just kept it pointed at sun and it was giving us more, more than what it was rated for, which is pretty cool. 
Fantastic. Anybody else have any questions? Cliff, you're sitting there smiling, man. You don't have anything to say, brother? Uh, well, I was just wondering, he, he talked about, uh, I have uh, two gold zero 50-watt uh, panels. And I wonder how they compare to the, the panels that he's offering. Yeah, Gold Zero makes a really good panel. Uh, and the cool thing is that you can daisy chain those and put them together, which you can do with virtually any solar panel. They want you to use the same size and, and uh, wattage panels. Um, I've not used the Gold Zeros and put them up against the BioNOs. But the reviews that I've seen is that their panels are really good. Uh, and I think they're comparably priced to the Biono panels, if I remember right. I know their battery boxes are are um, comparably priced to what the girls are building. But if I remember right, um, they're using lithium ion instead of lithium iron phosphate in their lithium batteries. Yeah, Cliff has provided the, uh, the solar power system for our bonus points at field day for the past couple of years. So we've enjoyed the use of his goal zero. You know, that's something I need to put in the in the talk is you can get bonus points at field day and winter field day. That's a good reason to spend $3,000 on a solar system. <laughs> 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 you don't need to spend that much on a solar system, but uh, well, I, some people I think do. It's 100, 100 or 150 bonus points. <laughs> yeah, I think on, on field day, it's 150. And actually on uh, winter field day, it's uh, 1,500 bonus points for being on solar or oh, anything. Perfect anything emergency power. Well, I'm glad I wasn't in South Dakota for winter field day. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, there's a guy that uh, is just bought one of our solar generators that lives in Northern Montana. And he's like, well, I don't know how good solar is going to work. And I said, you're probably going to have to buy more than one panel. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. I know our battery will work, but um, so he's, he's purchased a couple um, the Biono power panels and when it gets to you know above freezing he'll go outside and tell us how it works um you know the, in the northern latitudes i don't have any experience running solar up in the northern latitudes everything i've done has been down here in the tropics <laughs> for the 12 minutes that it's above zero in montana for a year <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah, I, 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 he's he's up there and has like six children and they live on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I was like, more more power to you, man. <laughs> you bet. Okay, last chance for any questions. All right, well, James, we thank you immensely for, for spending your late evening with us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Keep in Greatly mind, appreciate the information. Beach. <laughs> yeah, Greatly we're actually, appreciate we, we are north of Daytona Beach, but nobody's ever heard of Flagler County. So um, Daytona Beach is the locator. If you if you fly into Daytona Beach, you're close enough to us. You're about 15 miles? Uh, we're about a half an hour north of the airport. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're square in between St. Augustine, Florida and Daytona Beach, Florida. Magic Mountain Amusement Park is the uh, is the marker for us. Yes, yes. <laughs> yep, I, I'm familiar with where you're talking about there. That, that's that's where we are at, so. Okay, yep. well now I know where you guys are in Santa Clarita. Absolutely. Yeah, well, when I go to California, it's just like somebody else drive, I don't want to. <laughs> I, I understand. But I'm sure yep. the girls would enjoy Magic Mountain. <laughs> you know, they, they probably would, and we've lived in Florida for six years now and never been to Disney World. Uh, it's just not something we do. Okay. So, um, we, uh, they've, they've been on some roller coasters at other places, but I'm sorry. Oh, Disney does have a ham radio club and we went over to their ham radio club. They have a really, really cool ham radio club over there, okay. uh, but we've never actually been in the parks as a family. Uh, right. it, you know, go as a family to Disney world. You need to take a second mortgage on your house. So <laughs> well, we've, we've been noticing that here with Disneyland. I think that the entry fees are 120 to $136 now per person. Yeah, I, I, I worked, like I said, I, we interviewed one of the original Imagineers that worked directly with Walt Disney and did a documentary on these guys. And uh, one thing Walt Disney do, knew how to do was make money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we we once again appreciate your, your time, James, and, and thank you very, very much for, for sharing your design concepts on, on GoKits. We, we appreciate that. Your presentation is, is absolutely fabulous. 
So thank, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate your family it. sharing you with us tonight. Yes. Yep. Thanks. I appreciate it.